I am Rachel Woody, and we're here today. It's December 11th with Don and Carolyn Bayard, and we're at Brooks Winery, uh, which used to be the site of Hidden Springs Winery, correct? Well, not so technically know. not <laughs> the location, because the old uh, winery that they used to be in is up the hill uh, to the west of this location, about a quarter of a mile. The old prune dryer where John Groshaw is now. Excellent. And Brooks was there for like seven years and then moved here last summer. That's right. So Good. Well, I'll start you off with our first question, which is why wine? It's a good question to start with. <laughs> and, and, and to answer that, we have to go back quite a ways, uh, back to uh, a place called Michigan, uh, from where both Carolyn and I came from. Uh, we're both uh, Michigan uh, born, uh, but we were raised uh, about 10 hour drive away from each other within the same state. She was from Upper Peninsula, Michigan, which is along Lake Superior, and I was raised in Detroit area. So uh, we, we went our different ways and eventually met in, in the Detroit area later in life. But uh, the story about us getting into wine really started back in the early days with my mom uh, teaching me the evils of alcohol. And, and uh, I carried that, that that uh, message uh, through uh, high school and college and and on uh, after college I went in the army uh, for a couple of years after uh, back in those days we had to take uh, ROTC in college mandatory two years and so uh, once I took two years I thought well I'm gonna have to go in the army anyway because the draft was in place and so I thought I wasn't going to go in, I might as well go in as an officer. So I took a, two additional years of ROTC and I got a commission on graduation. So I went into the Corps of Engineers uh, because I wanted to get in a topographic unit and my interests were in the area of geography. And uh, that's where the topographic units were in, uh, in Corps of Engineers. So they assigned me to uh, Europe, <laughs> much to my pleasure. And so I was assigned to an area around Frankfurt. And uh, uh, we, as guys, used to go down to the Rhine River and uh, visit uh, these wine, wine festivals that they would have. Uh, and and uh, much to my amazement, these people were having so much fun and the wine tasted so good that uh, I, that's when I started to doubt my mom's teachings about the evils of alcohol. So we had a lot of fun there and enjoyed the, the, uh, the experience in Germany and learned a little bit about wine because you have to realize that being raised in uh, the Midwest, uh, our, our access to, to good wine was pretty limited. And we were drinking wines uh, like uh, Mogan uh, David, David uh, <laughs> Ripple, Ripple, Red Rocket, uh, all those <laughs> Midwest wines, I guess you might say. But uh, it was a truly uh, uh, amazing event for me to taste the Rieslings that came out of the Rhine River Valley and, and uh, how good they were in comparison with what I'd had in the past. So uh, after completing my military service, came back to graduate school at Eastern Michigan, and, uh, uh, and that's in Ypsilanti. And uh, uh, that's where I met this lovely blonde chick. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in, in Ypsilanti. And, uh, she was a stewardess with United Airlines. And that's where the base was for the United uh, uh, Airfield, which uh, at Metropolitan Airport, and that was located in Ypsilanti, is before the Detroit area uh, airport, it's which Willow was, Run. It was called Willow Run, yeah, which where they made lots of bomber planes uh, in the old days for World War II. But, uh, the airport has moved now closer to Detroit. It's called Metropolitan Airport. Anyway, uh, we met there in 1964 
and I was uh, finishing up my master's at the time and uh, did a master's thesis and on urban planning and dealt with uh, locating uh, uh, multiple family developments within the urban area, not on the su suburban areas, but within, and a methodology to figure that out. And once I f finished my classes, uh, we decided uh, relatively quickly <coughs> that, uh, that we were gonna get married. And uh, she had a transfer into San Francisco, so I had to move pretty fast to, to get this deal solidified. I promised to take her to San Francisco on her honeymoon. Oh, <laughs> one month. <laughs> yeah, one month after meeting. We figured that out. So uh, in 1965, we, we uh, were married. And we got married so fast that people thought, of course, that we had to get married. And uh, not sure you need that. Man. <laughs> but then three, three years later, with no children, they figured that we didn't have to get married. <laughs> and then they thought we couldn't have children. So, because three years is a long time. Uh, but then when we started having children, we started with Heidi, and. Uh, uh, that's uh, that's another story. It's not necessary. Not necessary. No. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we uh, we we had a lot of fun with my relatives, which were in the Detroit area, uh, Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, uh, and they were a lot of fun. My aunts and uncles. But about that time in our life. Uh, they started to retire from their employment. And uh, what they did was pick everything up and move to Florida. That's what Midwesterners do. And we, we looked at each other and says, no, we don't want to move to Florida. That's not, that's not in our, our ballpark. Uh, so let's figure this out. Uh, we decided we wanted to live where we're gonna retire. So uh, we decided we would take a trip, a couple trips, and explore the U.S. Uh, to find out if there were better places than where we were. And that was Ann Arbor, and Ann Arbor's an oasis within the Midwest. But yet it still had the Midwestern climate and so forth. But during, during this time after marriage and, and uh, finishing my thesis, I started making homemade wine because of the interest that uh, Riesling had, had uh, uh, gained in my, uh, my ballpark. Uh, that, was, that was something I wanted to do. And it's kind of an art form, uh, thinking uh, these different grapes that you can use, but we, we were limited. I couldn't, I couldn't get Riesling, but I could get grapes from the Pawpaw area of Michigan, which is uh, over on the west side of Michigan, Long Lake, Lake Michigan. And they grow, at that time, a lot of American grapes. Catawba, Niagara, Delaware, Concord, all those American style. We called them slip skins, because you squeeze them and they pop out in your mouth. And, uh, that wasn't Riesling, but it was, it was okay. Uh, not, uh, not, not great wine, but drinkable wine. So I would meet the tank truck in Ann Arbor, uh, where a fellow would crush the grapes over there, and he had a truck that was compartmentized, and uh, he could uh, fill my containers with each variety. And so from there, I would make, uh, make the wine at home. And subsequently, uh, on one of these trips that we went out uh, to look at various cities, uh, we, we went to Minneapolis, Denver, Seattle, Portland, San and San Francisco. Francisco. And although we liked San Francisco, we realized real quickly that we couldn't live in the city, couldn't afford to live in the city and uh, work there. And our my philosophy was I wanted to live within bicycle range of work. And so that didn't fit. Uh, but Portland, Seattle, could have worked. 
but Portland uh, was, was real attractive. It was in April, and so all the rhododendrons and azaleas were in bloom, and Michigan was still so gray and dirty and snowy. <laughs> Big influence. That, she bought that part. <laughs> I like the overall geography and the closeness to the ocean and the snow and the mountains and the unique growing conditions in the, in the Willamette Valley. And, and three things that, that stuck out in my mind. One was no mosquitoes, mm -hmm. no humidity, and no snow. When you come from the upper Midwest, that's, those are significant elements to, to eliminate. And if those are gone, then life could be pretty good. So we decided, and I had stopped by the Port of Portland to uh, uh, talk with a friend that worked there. I knew he worked there. and. So uh, we chatted a bit and I left my resume. I didn't have any positions open at that time and I hadn't finished my thesis yet, so I, I, uh, I just left my thesis, or my resume. So uh, a year later, uh, after this trip, and we had decided that the Northwest was for us, uh, I finished my thesis and uh, got my uh, resume together and started getting addresses to send that out to various places and and I out of the blue I got a call from the Port of Portland. Uh, we have this senior planner position open. Are you still interested? Well yes. <laughs> so I they flew me out and we talked about the job and uh, I accepted the job and, and so they moved us out. Uh, with enough money to, uh, to load everything except the player piano that I was rebuilding. He had rebuilt the whole thing and we couldn't afford to bring it out. <laughs> <laughs> so. They gave us $1,500 to move. <laughs> <laughs> that was in 68. <laughs> so, uh, no, 69. 69, yeah. So uh, I loaded up the station wagon uh, that we had including a 15-gallon keg of wine uh, from Michigan in the station wagon and, uh, and towed another car, a Volkswagen that I'd brought back from Germany and was in the service. And I dropped Carolyn and Heidi and one-week-old Holly off at her mom's place in Upper Michigan. So we went up to Upper Michigan, dropped them off, and I drove to Oregon. Slept in the car. Slept in the car. Was excited about going through this town called Pendleton. And my vision of Pendleton was a college town with green grass and lovely trees. And, and uh, when I came up out of Lewiston, Idaho, up on top of the, the plateau with the wheat growing and it was uh, mature and, and brown and, and uh, really pretty, but I thought, huh, it's gonna have to do a lot of changing <laughs> when I get to Pendleton. And when I got to Pendleton, it wasn't anywhere near what I had visioned. It was the end of July. <laughs> and keep in mind, I'd never been to Eastern Oregon, I'd just been to the Willamette Valley. And, that, that vision extended all the way over there. So uh, a little bit disappointed in Pendleton, what I found, but at least compared to my vision. And I uh, arrived in Portland and we, I rented a house and then Carolyn and the kids came out in about a month? No, it was just two weeks. Two weeks, she says. Uh, uh, and rented a house in, in s southeast Portland uh, temporarily, and then we bought a, eventually bought a house on Mount Tabor. And uh, so I was working with the Port of Portland. I had, it's a neat place to work, uh, a lot of interesting jobs that, to do, uh, spoil study, where to put the sand that, that comes out of the river. As you know, the Portland Airport is all built on spoils from the river or sand. Uh, from dredging the channels and river gate, that whole industrial complex is all on the sand from the river. So I was, one of my projects was to do that. And then fortunately, I got the job of, of putting together the first environmental statement done in the state. Uh, the Portland airport was 
being, uh, the runways were being widened and, and uh, rotated and so they needed an environmental statement because that was 1972, the Environmental Policy Act was passed and so we had to do the environmental statement. Well, that was the first one done in the state. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, the highway division was in Salem was uh, lacking uh, environmental statements for their projects and they were starting to stack up and they were panicking because the federal money was going to go away and so forth. So, but before that <clears throat> happened, in my employment with the Port of Portland, we were working on a land use project that was uh, a combination of the county and the port uh, around the airport, or what we call Columbia South Shore, that's Troutdale to the Interstate Bridge. There was a um, uh, area there along the river, part of the old floodplain, uh, that the port was interested in keeping the runways clear of major development, runway approaches, and the county was interested in preserving that farmland around, along the Columbia South Shore because it's excellent, excellent farmland, for, especially for row crops and, uh, and nursery stock uh, uh, dormant uh, uh, trees that, uh, that, well, they go dormant in the winter and they have that cold air that comes in that, that hardens them off in the winter. It's perfect, lots of water, all the perfect things you need to grow uh, trees and, and uh, shrubs. Uh, so in the process of doing that, we hired a, a consultant to help us out. So we hired a, a firm called CH2M, local consulting firm. And so they sent this young kid over and, and so he was helping us with this project. And, and um, he says uh, one day to me, uh, hey Don, uh, I gotta leave early today. I gotta, gotta go out to my farm. And I said, what, what are you doing with a farm? We're downtown Portland. And, and he says, well, these guys from Davis came up from the University of California and they think they can ripen wine grapes in Oregon. Now keep in mind that I had made wine in Michigan and when I got here, I looked around for grapes in Oregon and what we considered utopia and there were no grapes in utopia. I found out the University of California was teaching students it was too cold here to grow wine grapes. Darn, that, that was disappointing. But then when I asked Bill, this fellow that worked for us as a consultant, uh, why, why he was, had a farm, he says, well, he thinks that he's, he can, they can ripen wine grapes and he and Susan, this is Bill Blosser, see, uh, he and Susan bought 20 acres out in Dundee and they're gonna plant grapes. So my, my heart started beating and I racing and I couldn't wait to get home <laughs> to tell Carolyn this great news. <laughs> And so I hauled her out to the Bill and Susan's place that weekend, and uh, they were <laughs> they were out in the field pulling blackberries out of this twenty with acres. a postal digger planting some grapes, the two of them together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, but they yeah. had a postal digger like this, you know, ma manual one, and they were. And they and, had they had grapes. They were renting a house, and they had the attic full of little grape plants. Dormant. They were starting, and they had the windows up. open in the end of the attic so that they would remain dormant until they were ready to plant. And <laughs> it was it was interesting, but I was able to talk Carolyn into buying 20 acres to grow homemade wine. We drove around for a year looking for the right property, and she. Uh, she didn't know you could make 10,000 gallons with 20 acres, so that was a little bit of a con job there, but I thought it was worth it. <laughs> so uh, we, 
we looked for a year for the right property and uh, w w our criteria was mostly based on on uh, heat and exposure and uh, south southeast slope and up out of the valley uh, uh, similar to those conditions that they plant grapes in Europe in Germany and France and they're all on the hillsides and that's what the University of California didn't realize they had the data to show that you couldn't ripen grapes here but it was based on uh, heating degree days and their data came from the weather stations and the weather stations are all located at the airports and the airports are all on the valley floor. So they were right in a sense, you can't grow grapes at the airport, but if you get up out of the valley up on the hillside, you, it becomes significantly warmer than in the valley. And it didn't take long for me to be reassured that that was the case when I was out here working in the vineyard and I would head home to Salem uh, I would have to roll the window up when I got down into the valley where I was in my shirt sleeves up here on the, on the hillside. But uh, the, the uh, uh, meeting of Bill uh, really um, started the process early. I would have found this out later, but it may have been a couple three years later because I, I was purchasing grapes uh, at a, a fruit importer called Gatto and Son in Portland that were importing Zinfandel uh, from Cucamonga by rail. And I would go down and pick, pick up my lugs of grapes and uh, uh, I was, well, all the rest of the people there picking up their grapes were Italians. <laughs> <laughs> and they were making big red wines out of Zinfandel. And so that's what I did too for a couple of years because I didn't have any source of grapes. And we had on uh, New Year's Eve when everybody else was out partying, <clears throat> we had three little ones and uh, we would wait till about two o'clock in the morning and we'd go around all the alleys and we'd pick up champagne bottles and wash them and bottle our, his wine. Yeah, that, we were making some sparkling wine too. That's what we needed and those for. <laughs> we had a nice home in uh, southeast Portland and uh, it had a basement. And one day I'm upstairs and <laughs> I hear all this noise downstairs and um, the, some of the bottles were popping their corks and it was a good <laughs> thing it, the little wine cellar had a drain. That's <laughs> when oh, no. so we learned about filtering and everything else. <laughs> yeah. You learn, you learn through, through doing. <laughs> he was all self-taught. He just read books. That's yep. So you guys are looking for land, and I'm curious, how did you know what to look for while you were trying to find that piece of property? And tell me more about that. Well, uh, as I said, we were looking for a year for land. Um, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of land for sale, uh, but, but uh, one of the pieces of the puzzle uh, was that Dundee uh, was semi-proven area at that time. That was the best we knew at that point. Uh, but also the Eola Hills had an opportunity too, and and with my background in geography and climatological classes, uh, I concluded that there wasn't much difference in climate between those two areas. Uh, and, and we didn't know a whole lot about soils uh, at that time. That wasn't really a criteria. For, for me, uh, I, I took the job at the Department of Transportation as environmental director uh, and that meant I had to move to Salem. So that became an instrumental part of the criteria about where, where we want because this is significantly closer to Salem across the Wheatland Ferry and, and the bridge in town uh, than it is from Dundee. So uh, in looking at the two areas, uh, I decided this was a good place. 
And then the criteria was 200 foot above the valley floor where you get into that inversion layer in the evening. Uh, you get out of the frost zone uh, that occurs in the valley. And that's a, that's a significant element because I have many times looked down on the valley and there are some vineyards on the valley floor that I can see from up, uh, up here where our vineyard is. And uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the early frost can occur before harvest and uh, you can see brown vineyards uh, where ours are still green. There's never been frost up here. Yeah, it's we've never had a frost event at, at this vineyard, never. Uh, so I decided uh, that, a, that a southeast slope was the best. Uh, southwest is okay, or west, east, south, but my, in my experience, and, and my judgment, and this is all, everybody has different feelings about site selection and relationship to al altitude and latitude. Um, that the early morning sun coming up over the Cascades, uh, your vineyard is, is in the sun. And it warms gradually over the, the day length. And if you're on the west side, you don't get the sun till maybe 10 o'clock or nine. It has to get quite high before it gets any sun. And on the east side, you get the uh, slowly uh, heating up of the vineyard. And, and then at the hottest part of the day, which is three to four o'clock, you don't get the extreme heat that you might get on the westerly slope. And if you get above 90 degrees, you're not improving the the, the grapes uh, ability to mature and ripen fruit and that sort of thing without uh, it kind of goes into almost a shutdown uh, of protection mode because it's just too hot and uh, the the potential for sunburn is even greater so I, I'm thinking that the hot part of the day uh, the east side is uh, has less rays of, of sun per per square inch and therefore you get less heat and that's that's my theory. Now there are lots of vineyards on the west side <laughs> that produce very nice wine so everyone has their own opinion about that. Uh, but we did uh, find a 20 acre parcel on Eola Hills Road um, that uh, we purchased in 1973. And uh, we called it Eola Hills Vineyard. And we started uh, that. It had, it had 15 acres of 100-year-old cherry trees on it and five acres of Brooks prunes. And uh, so I learned a lot about farming uh, just by taking care of those, those crops that are already there. The resources available from the guy I bought the property from, he still had I don't know, 80 acres and still was farming cherries. He lived right here. He lived next door to the land that I bought. and So I had lots of advice on how to farm. <laughs> and I uh, just needed to get equipment and so forth. So uh, that's kind of where I, I cut my teeth. In the meantime, I started planting grapes and took out some of the cherry trees. And I left the prunes to last because we did harvest the prunes and dried those and we sold those as dried prunes. Okay, so we were talking about selecting the land and learning how to farm it and you started to plant your grapes. So did you plant your grapes by yourself or how did that work? We used, our friends would come out and help us. We plant, took down about two acres of trees. Um, a year for at, for at first, right? Well, whenever there was a, a caterpillar up on the, the hill doing some work, I would uh, ask them to come over on their, their way out <laughs> and push over some more trees for me so I could clear that area. And, and yes, we had people come out and help plant, however. And, and trade for wood. They uh, would take yeah. wood and fruit. 
I'd cut the wood up and, and uh, they would uh, take wood back in exchange for, for labor. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it was, uh, I learned a lot about it and I, I wasn't constrained by uh, previous methods to do things. I was able to think through a process and, and I, I, I found a pretty efficient way to plant and uh, I don't think anybody uses those methods today or ever did but it was efficient for me. It took longer to lay out the vineyard than it did to uh, plant it. As I and a guy with a bucket behind a tractor full of plants could, could plant very quickly. Uh, Not just a guy, the girls were there too. <laughs> no, 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 this was a bucket of grapes. They didn't, well, early on, early on we drilled a hole for each plant. Well, I learned that, that that's very labor intensive and, and handling the, the, the kind of augers that we had back then, uh, hand augers, it was a, a two-man job to, to drill a hole. And uh, I eventually had an auger on the back of the tractor and then I figured out I didn't need an auger at all. But uh, we, the whole, the we... whole family planted the first ones. Yeah. Even the little girls, they were, their yeah. youngest, Heather, that works here, she was three. And uh, you know, one would put the fertilizer in and the other the plant and <laughs> they, they remember that. We'd come up here and stay on weekends because we were still living in Portland while Don commuted to, to Salem before we bought a home. And we had bought a little travel trailer. And we would come up and spend the weekends in that little travel trailer while we harvested um, the cherries and the prunes and the cherry pickers came at 5.30 in the morning, you know, their families, their dogs, their pans of cornbread and singing in the trees at 5.30 in the morning and I'm thinking, what have we done? <laughs> it was, you know, we were camping in a trailer. We had no water irrigation here. Uh, we just had an outdoor toilet. <laughs> it was, we did this for how many years? Mm. Until seven. Ten years. Yeah, yeah. So what was your take on that, Carolyn? Do you think you know this is just a, a crazy dawn adventure, or what were your thoughts? Um, well, I had three babies a year apart, and um, he was, he would leave early in the morning to go to work, and then after work, he'd have to come out here and work, and we'd spend all our weekends out here, and I guess I didn't even really think about it. <laughs> I just did it. <laughs> You know, and uh, it wasn't easy. <laughs> there were times when I'd go home from the trailer with the girls for the, to Portland for the, <laughs> to shower and do laundry, and he, I'm sure he thought, wondered if I was going to come back. <laughs> yeah. It was. It the, was the, the, this is Jory Clay Loam, and it uh, is very reddish, and it doesn't take long to get dirty. And the girls never failed to, <laughs> to, to cover themselves with dirt, yeah. and and uh, so she she was great though in the process, <laughs> of especially preparing lunches, which I didn't have to worry about, and she was she was a great support for the. When he retired, effort. I told him, "No more sandwiches." <laughs> 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 You guys planted the vineyard and worked it, um, commuted because you had another job, you're raising three young children. The wine industry is historically very hard on marriages, so I'm wondering what that was like for you two, how did you navigate that, what's the secret? Well, we were also running the winery and um, when the girls were eight, the youngest one was eight, I went to work also to support the vineyard and um, because in the early days the banks would fund no money for you it was all mortgaging your house using all your savings both of you working full-time jobs and then doing this on weekends and evenings and um, I take a break I gotta what was the rest of the question 
Well, how our marriage survived. Yes. Yes. Well, I would always say no business after eight or nine o'clock at night, no discussion, that we just had to forget about it. Get up the next day and tackle it again. And all our kids are all working full-time jobs and with their families too, and I try to tell them the same thing. You just, there's a point in your day. We always had family dinner. We tried to have family dinner. Wasn't very fancy sometimes. There was a lot of grilled cheese and tomato soup when we were <laughs> all working, commuting. <laughs> Friday nights was pizza night. We'd bring home as many as we could and let all the kids bring all their friends over. But um, it, uh, we saw a lot of marriages break up, um, but uh, we made it. 50 yeah. years last year. <laughs> yeah, 50 years this, uh, this year. Congratulations, it's a big milestone. Yep, so I guess we're gonna make it. <laughs> <laughs> Have we made it? <laughs> He'd always tease me, well, I guess on our anniversary, I guess we'll renew your, I'll renew your contract another year or something like that. He's he, well, a I, lot of humor. He's, he's a very funny man. And I think that that has helped us. I'm more serious, more conservative, but he has a he has a very quick, good sense of humor, and I think that that has. Always us. introduce her as my first wife, uh, and and that 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 wasn't all that significant in our generation, but today <laughs> it is. Absolutely. And uh, just an example, uh, <laughs> we went out. For uh, our kids got us a little gift certificate for a, a restaurant up in Dayton called the Barlow Room. And so we decided to go there for our anniversary dinner, just the two of us. So we went up there and uh, we got a table for two and uh, we're sitting there having our dinner and there's a table for eight uh, right next to us. And so pretty soon a couple of young chicks came over and sat at the table uh, for eight, and I thought, oh, well, oh. <laughs> that's a pleasant surprise. And, and then two more showed up, and they're like 20 years old. And then, uh, and then four more showed up. And I thought, wow, what's going on? And Carolyn can't, can't hold herself back and says, well, what's going on with you guys? And they said, well, it's a wedding party. Bachelorette party. Bachelorette party. They're, they're staying in a, a, a bed and breakfast in Dayton. and. They're having a wedding tomorrow. And they were up from all over the United States. Yeah, they came in from all um, New York and New Orleans and all, all sorts of places. And uh, and they says, well, where are you guys from? Well, he we said, well, we're just, we're just locals. <laughs> we're just here celebrating our anniversary. And of course, the whole conversation at the table is marriage and stuff. And so they said, oh, how long have you been married? And we said, well, 50 years. <gasps> 50 years? My gosh! And you can see 50 years go all the way down the table <laughs> and then come back, you know. They've been married 50 years. Can you believe that? <laughs> so I, I asked them if they had entertainment for the bachelorette party. <laughs> uh, offering your services. <laughs> offering my services. <laughs> but uh, we got got our bill, and so I got my credit card out, and gift certificate, and the waitress comes over and says, "Oh, you don't have to use that. Your your dinner's been paid for by the twenty-year-old chicks." Eight, eight twenty-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was totally a, a surprise, and and just just how meaningful it is that that. Uh, today, what 50 years of marriage? Is. When he calls me, he says I'm his first wife. I always say he's my last husband. <laughs> <laughs> She's had enough. <laughs> <laughs> but the but the wine industry helps with that sort of thing. <laughs> it can make you happy too. <laughs> So tell me, how did you get into then the winery side? Ah, that's a good question. I, I was making homemade wine, of course. That's what, where I was headed and why I bought the 20 acres is to make homemade wine. And Well, uh, in 19, this is 1973, so in 1970, 
Well, 77, I started to realize that I could grow more wine than I could drink. And so I needed to do something. So uh, I, uh, I, we have a, a building up the hill from us here, and it's the only bill is 3,000 square foot, and it's a, it was a former prune dehydrator. There was a prune dryer on every hill in Oregon that, <laughs> that back during the, during the uh, later wartime years when prunes were desirable to ship to the front lines as a fruit you could ship. And um, uh, that, was, that was the only building around this area that would be suitable for a winery. So I bought that building in 19, uh, and 25 acres. 1979, and I got 25 acres with it. Well, I didn't, didn't really, I wasn't looking for the land, I was just looking for the building. But anyway, it, it was full of prune equipment and two dryer, two tunnels in it. And so, uh, and the first year, uh, I sold grapes to home winemakers, 1979. And so I, I bought some crushing equipment and press, and, and I was able to crush the grapes and sell them the juice and rent, rent them some barrels. I got some, some oak barrels and some uh, stainless steel barrels for whites. And, uh, and uh, they paid me by the gallon for the juice. And at 18, guys that made wine up there that year. And the uh, most prominent one is, is Jim Berno of, of Willamette Valley Vineyards. He made his first Pinot Noir at my place in 1979. Before he started the winery. <laughs> That's really cool. Way back. And, and they were all amazed. It was, it was really fun to see these guys that had been make, previously making mostly fruit wines um, and some grape wines, but here we, we uh, I had a fellow that was a, a winemaker come out and, and uh, help uh, with every, everything and Thursday night we come out and make wine and uh, it was uh, fun to see their reactions to tasting the wine that they'd made, which were incredible. They, they really were, <laughs> compared to what they'd had made before. Compared to apple and... <laughs> yeah, any fruit wine. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's, that was a start. And then the next year, I can see the volume was going to be more than I could deal with. You know, if you, if you doubled that, that'd be a lot of individuals. And you can make 200 gallons as a, in a in a home, but that's, that's a lot of people to deal with. And so I realized I had to, to uh, do something commercial. So, and, and I got a visit from uh, a fellow from, uh, uh, I was you know, now working in state government and, and I got a visit from a guy from the uh, Attorney General's office uh, by the name of Al Alexanderson, and he had a proposal for me, uh, and and it the proposal was he had some equipment and he had the money to buy other equipment and he could come as a partner with equipment and I had the building and the grape source that we could do a winery together. So Al Alexanderson and his wife. Uh, uh, we we formed a a winery called Hidden Springs. And Al was the original owner of the property where rec for um, what's the one in West Salem? <laughs> Red Hawk. Red Hawk. The, the, <clears throat> the, the uh, and, and Al Alexanderson was. Uh, the original owner of the vineyard at Red Hawk and built the house that's there at Red Hawk uh, Winery. And uh, I helped plant 
helped him plant that vineyard. For, and I used to go down and do a lot of farm work on it to get it, get it going. Uh, and Al and I um, and our wives uh, came up with the name and of Hidden Springs. And it, it has significant meaning in the sense that we got our water from a spring that's up on top of the hill here, virtually, uh, virtually on top. And we don't know where that water comes from. It comes out of a spring, and, and uh, so we called the winery Hidden Springs. And, and uh, the water was important to us because we've never had irrigation on our vineyard. We always planted before, tried to plant before the end of April so that Mother Nature would soak the grapes in good. Um, but we never had any irrigation. The very first year we planted was in July. And we had to take a tank of water around buckets of water and water those plants all summer. Which <laughs> so we learned to plant earlier in the year. Plant early. Yeah. Early as you can get the grapes and get the ground laid out and get them in. Then you don't need irrigation. And the prune dryer we bought, it was still a prune dryer when we bought it full of old, old equipment, and we had to take out a drying tunnel, to, and we left one in there for storage. And then that's, it was, we sold it to Cuneo Sellers, and then Rex Hill was in there, and then um, Brooks Winery has, was in that same prune dryer f before they built this winery. So it's still going on, <laughs> the winery. It's become an incubator winery location for small wineries to start out in. That's had a good track record. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who were some of the early grape growers, winemakers when you guys got going? Well, keep in mind that when we, when we started the vineyard in 73, there were nine wineries in Oregon. Okay, and half of those were fruit wineries, like Honeywood and Oak Knoll, and there were a couple of- Hillcrest. Well, Hill, Hillcrest was, Vinifera, but that was in Roseburg, and Irie, and, and uh, Erath, and, and Charles Curry, Curry Vineyards up in Forest Grove. And then there's one near in Mount Hood. That was a fruit one. Fruit winery, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's all it was. Now, we, these pioneers came up. They got degrees from Davis and how to do all this. Well, we would meet, uh, there was a meeting in the fire, fire hall at Tiger. Once a month, first Tuesday of the month, we would all get together there and talk about growing grapes. How are we gonna do this? And what they had been taught down there wasn't really, <laughs> it was a good background. But uh, this was a totally different environment here. I mean, we're on the edge of being able to ripen wine grapes. And down there, that's not a consideration. You know, sun, exposure, and all that. And, and uh, the, it, we, we were wide open for things like, well, what's the row width? What should it be? I mean, that's, that's one of the first things you start with. <laughs> you have to make a decision. How wide are your rows going to be? Well, California it was 12 foot. That was the standard down there. And uh, none of us thought 12 foot was appropriate. None of us. But what was the right width? And it, it kind of boiled down to how wide is your tractor? <laughs> and, and there weren't very many tractors that, that were that narrow the, of what we were thinking about. I even went through the thought process of planting 12 foot rows and then when I had the money to buy appropriate equi equipment, uh, I could interplant to make it six foot rows. Mm -hmm. But then I also knew how difficult it is to plant a plant in an existing vineyard and, and have it survive because the competition is so great. And, I'm thinking that the other row won't ever be as good as it, it could be if they're all planted at the same time. So I abandoned that thought and uh, went with uh, a nine-foot row. 
and quite a few planted at nine foot. There's some at eight. Uh, you, 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 you could narrow your tractor down by reversing the wheels and, and uh, changing rims out and squeeze it in a little bit. But uh, I started with a, a NAA Ford tractor, uh, which is the old gray red tractors of the, of the day. Um, and that served me well. Uh, till I started loading totes of grapes onto a truck and then there's no power steering <laughs> and eventually we went to a to a, a bigger tractor uh, because of that but the totes kept getting bigger uh, what was it like being one of the first I, you know there, you mentioned there were at the time, was it sort of exciting, scary, both? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was it was it was scary in the sense that uh, nobody else had done this, and 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 uh, even though that we had the pioneers here, uh, they had never done this either, and it was uh, it was a learning process, and. The, this, uh, I mentioned the meeting that we had in Tigert. Uh, that, that went till about 1974 or 75. We lost the, the meeting room at the Tigert Fire Hall. They moved the fire hall, I think, or fire station, and we lost that meeting room. And the, the meeting just never picked up again. And that kind of bothered me because that was such a great asset, especially for me. Learning. Learning about new things and, and hearing other people talk about how they solved problems that we had. Uh, and and I, I started the meeting again, uh, but I had moved to Salem by then, and uh, I had a, a different focus. Uh, and so I started the, the meeting again in Salem in 1978. And anybody in the area that was growing grapes and making wine could come to the meeting. And uh, it was the first Tuesday of the month. Same format we'd always used. Uh, uh, is any, anybody have anything to buy that they need for their vineyard or winery? Or anybody has anything extra they want to sell? Something. And uh, if you have any burning questions about how to grow grapes or make wine, this is the time to ask it because you got resources around here that could ask it. And then we'd always invite a program in of some sort. It's basically Edu for growers. It's mostly for Mo the growers. Mostly growers, but winery too. Winery too. And uh, we we would uh, bring presentations in of information for, for the industry. So it was an educational meeting and it was before AVAs and things of, you know, where people regionalize. And uh, I, I actually am proud to say that that meeting is still going today, uh, since 1978. And it's held today at McNary Golf Club, where we happen to live, <laughs> reside. And we have a nice room to meet in. We have, we start at six o'clock. We. Uh, have, we bring a bottle of wine and we have uh, uh, a social time and drink wine and, and order dinner, have dinner, and then by seven the meeting starts. And, and it's, it's been successful because there's, there's no bylaws, there's no officers, there's no dues, there's no nothing. It's the same night. And it doesn't even really have a name, <laughs> except the wine growers meeting. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, email has done a lot to keep that going because it's so easy to to send out a distribution list to reminder people that the meeting is on Tuesday night and tell them what the program is. And so we have 45 to 50 people at times come. After he started the winery, um, then we weren't able to be as active. We went to what meetings we could, but then Ed Greenwood took over the meetings and he still is doing those for <laughs> Yeah, he's a moderator. Moderate master of ceremonies. Yeah. What call and Betty O'Brien does the programs. Program. She she's uh, involved in the industry quite a bit and she brings people in to I mean everything from 
drone technology to OSU bringing uh, their skills to the table and uh, insurance sessions and just whatever's related to the wine industry we try to bring in. So it's open to anybody that has an in interest in the wine industry. What were some of those early struggles that either the Tigard Hall meeting or the later the wine growers meeting had to address? And how have those changed? Well, one thing, we planted many different varieties up here. Oregon State even had gave us some grapes right to plant. And we planted all these different varieties because nobody really knew for sure what to plant. So the, much of the time we was spent replanting, <coughs> pulling out the Chardonnay at the, that we had planted, almost five acres of, right? Three acres, Three yeah. Three acres of we, Chardonnay. We, we, when we started, we planted one-third Chardonnay, one-third Riesling, one-third Pinot Noir. Those, those are the big three. We figured our, our uh, climate is better than Germany, uh, maybe the same as Burgundy. So we planted Chardonnay and, and Pinot Noir from Burgundy and Riesling from Germany. And that, that's as far as we knew. We didn't know what was well, going to be. we planted a row of Cabernet, a row of <laughs> Merlot, yeah, just, uh, just Portuguese for, Blue, Muscat. Just, um, just for a, a own amusement and amazement, we planted a row of everything else I could get just to see what they looked like and how they did here. And, and uh, actually, I planted a row of Cab, and uh, two rows of Cab and two rows of Merlot right next to each other. And uh, every year, the Cabernet produced these beautiful clusters. And uh, the Merlot, would, the clusters were you could, hard to recognize that they were grapes. They were shot berries, just, just, just straggly looking things every year. So there's something about our climate that is, is different for that specific variety. But yet, its sister, so to speak, Cabernet, uh, produced beautiful clusters. Now, they didn't get ripe most of the time, but some years, warm years, uh, we were able to produce a, a Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon, and two years out of, I don't know, 20, 20 years, I produced a, a cab that I actually bottled and labeled as a Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, it was, it, was, it was ripe in the sense that it had enough sugar, but it wasn't mature. It didn't have enough time on the vine, and as a result, it had a little herbaceous kind of flavor to it that uh, is, is recognizable as a grape that's not quite ripe. Well, and another thing in the early days was, you know, employees getting people to work. We'd go down to the employment agency, and they would send up people. Um, some would come up, work half a day, never show up again. They didn't like working in the rain. Um, we'd put signs out on the side of the road and um, just, we had, we did this for till 97 when we had a vineyard service kind of come take over. The, he did a lot of the tractor work still, but uh, just we, we, we did all the work up until 1970, 19. 80. 80. Yeah, when we started the winery or something. Yeah. Well, we no, 1997 is when we hired the vineyard service. 97. But up until yeah. then, we, we'd get um, get our own employees and stuff. Yeah. And um, in 97, we uh, this fella approached us that he was going to put together a vineyard management service. His name is Bob Bailey, and he is now Northwest Vineyard Services, and. And he, uh, he uh, asked me if, if I'd like to help put together something to start his business. And we got the uh, fellow down the road uh, here uh, to get his acreage involved. So we got him started in, in his vineyard service at that time. And, and that helped a lot because before that, I was pretty much doing the whole thing. And the paperwork with all the employees, different people all the time. and. It was. Now, keep in mind, we had a. We had a, both of us had jobs in town. 
we had a vineyard, we had a winery, we had three teenage daughters, which, <laughs> so we, we, we really recognized that we were spread too thin. And uh, that's the time, about 93, 1993, we decided we needed to unload something. Well, the daughters were probably out of the question. <laughs> but uh, I think we had just had them out here so much that they didn't want anything to do with <laughs> the wine industry in their future. <laughs> yeah. And now two of them are involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought, well, one's a viticulturalist, the other one an enologist, and then uh, another one wine marketing, but <laughs> it worked that didn't work out. <laughs> 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 but now, but now they're back in the industry, and two of them are anyway, and uh, uh, they wish they would maybe have listened earlier in life. Uh, but you were kind of cruel. He had a we had a really old '64 flatbed truck that we delivered the, all the grapes in. You know, the floor was rusted out, and <laughs> it's still sitting, I think, over here somewhere at the, the yellow fort. And he would purposely drive them through town, past Nordstroms and past Bush Park, where all their <laughs> friends were, and they'd be hiding. <laughs> they didn't want <laughs> to be seen. So he kind of did it to them, I think. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the term wine grower, what does, what would your definition of that be? And is that a uniquely Oregon term? No. Well, that's what we call our group in Salem, the wine growers. We grow grapes for wine. Yeah, they're, they're, you're not growing grapes, you're growing wine. In a sense, that's where it's going, and that's, that's, that ties the two together, mm -hmm. the winery and the vineyard, and that's a... That's a process that we we encourage, uh, and because the winemaker always wants to have an input into the growing of the grapes, and the, and of course the grower has a, a different interest in, in producing grapes. Depends on his and more interest in volume. Are going to produce the most revenue, so those two have to work that out, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Matter of fact, that's a session we've had at, the, at our growers meeting is the contracts and how all that should be done. When you got started, you were one of the first and Oregon was just starting to get back into wine post-prohibition and, and for the first time probably planting Vitis vinifera. Did you guys think it was going to be as successful as it is today? No. No. No, we had no, no idea that, that. I cried every 50 cent plant we put in the ground because <laughs> that, you know, when we had, to, it was a lot of money back then. <laughs> I, I think our, our perspective is different than the people coming in today. Um, uh, a lot of them come in with a, a, a big bag of money to invest in the Oregon industry and we didn't have that. And we didn't have the support that they have nowadays. Uh, we, we order corks. We had to order out of California. Um, bottling. Our, we had our own bottling equipment. I mean, it's a three-spout filler. By hand. <laughs> and one corker. Uh, and the kids did most of that. You know, corking. They could do that easily. Um, so, and, and any. Test if you want to do a malolactic test, uh, you had to do, do it yourself. There was no support. Mm -hmm. And now, and bottling, of course, <laughs> today, uh, the Brooks just pulls up a, a truck uh, from the Castillo kid and and uh, runs a hose out from from the tank. And I think the hose is the biggest thing issue, maybe. <laughs> How long it is, or. And uh, uh, in, uh, all you have to do is, is uh, put the bottles on one end and they come out labeled and corked and everything on the other end. It's, now, think about comparison of that and our spending hours and hours. Uh, sterile, sterile bottling, sterile filtering. So we make Riesling with a little bit of sweetness in it. If there's, if there's any one uh, amount of yeast and in that bottle and it'll ferment the, the sweetness that's in there. So 
you have to filter out all the yeast particles and there's yeast all around us so uh, we'll sterilize the equipment and and we have a spray bottle of uh, vodka <laughs> in a little spray bottle if, the, if anybody touched the uh, spout filler spout or any part that would be in contact with the wine you had to spray that to uh, kill any yeast that might be uh, on there so that was and yeast yeast is a, a significant element to filter out and we then we had to filter out and that's point seven five I think the filter size for yeast but and red wines then you had to go down to to uh, filter out any malolactic uh, bacteria which is a 0.45 filter and that's it's getting down there uh, so to do all that sterilize and, and keep everything going uh, was a, a, a significant job one Thanksgiving we drove our station wagon in a trailer and we went down to California got a a whole trailer load of barrels and um, got caught in a snowstorm with the kids on top of Shasta <laughs> the pass, <laughs> the skew pass. I mean there's just all these, we could go on and on and on about some of the stories. <laughs> we had, um, well we, we were, th there was another vineyard started the same way, year we did in the Yola Hills but other than that we were the very first one, major one and a lot of the Farmers and everything up here thought we were crazy, <clears throat> absolutely crazy. And now one of them is planting grapes for books. <laughs> so it's, uh, n n you know, they have, uh, people just were so unsure of the industry. It was, uh, which made you a little bit uncomfortable, <laughs> but it's exciting now to see the next generation. My husband went to an event and he came home and he says, Gosh, I felt so obsolete. He says there's all these energetic young <laughs> people with so much enthusiasm in the industry now. It's very, very exciting to me to see it come to the, that we have lived long enough to come to this point to see this happen in the industry. It's just amazing to and us. We've seen uh, drinking uh, habits change too. When we first started making Riesling and uh, I, I made dry Riesling, which I like, and uh, well, it was hard to sell here in Oregon. It was Alsatian style. And people, nope. were, people were interested in the sweeter, sweeter wines, and nowadays, people want to make sure the Rieslings are dry. <laughs> they don't That's like what those I think. Uh, you know, everybody says things about the California wine industry, but I said, the people that start with some of the California wines that are a little sweeter and all, that's who's coming to our tasting rooms. And so it's eventually evolved into a little more sophisticated palate, drier wines, and so uh, we... Uh, I might, uh, might tell you about the, the Riesling a little bit more. You know, I started with Riesling in Germany and uh, that piqued my interest uh, and I, I planted five acres of Riesling and then when when we all found out that Pinot Noir was our flagship a lot of the Riesling that we all planted in the beginning got grafted over to Pinot Noir except some of us because I, I like Riesling <laughs> but we and I kept my five acres I kept my five acres of Riesling. What were you we, weren't, we weren't getting very much money for the Riesling grapes, and so it was costing more to maintain the vineyard than you were getting for the grapes at that time. But, but we kept it because of my fondness of Riesling. Well, and, and, and then that's, the Riesling was the catalyst for Jimmy Brooks to come to me and and want to buy my Riesling because he liked to make dry Riesling and I like dry Riesling so we we kind of hit it off right away and we agreed uh, that I would sell him my my Riesling well then then he wanted to buy the Pinot after a couple of years he, he liked the vineyard and and uh, 
He liked the vineyard so much that he even talked about buying the vineyard someday. And I said, well, to me, when I'm ready and you have some money, then we can, we can talk. But right now, I'm not ready to sell. But he really uh, loved the vineyard. And uh, when we struck the deal, original deal on the Riesling, uh, he says, oh, oh, by the way, we want to farm it biodynamically. And I thought, hmm. never heard that word before, but sounds, sounds all right. What, what's that mean to me, Jimmy? <laughs> he says, well, we can't, we can't use any uh, herbicides or any chemicals in the sprays. And, well, we just used sulfur primarily, and that wasn't a big deal, but no herbicide in the, in the row, grape row, which I had been doing. No Roundup. Uh, no no pre-emergent or Roundup, and you had to do something to keep the weeds from growing up into the row. So I, I said, okay, I'll, I'll figure that one out. And so we, we did farm the, the, uh, uh, the Riesling at that point biodynamically. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do that for a Riesling, I might as well do the rest of the vineyard. So I just started with his program for the whole vineyard. Well, tell where you found the Bezzeriti. Yeah, yeah to, to, to solve the... Uh, I, I, there were machines on the market that were eight to $9,000 mounted on your tractor, hydraulic and German, and, and you could have done. But that was a whole lot of money for me at that time. And and so I found a, a, a little a piece of equipment up at uh, Oregon Vineyard Supply that was... In the weeds. <laughs> well, it was used uh, on the desk. I think the whole paper's down or something. But it was called a Bezzeriti, and it was uh, out of California. It was used on the end of discs, so the disc and orchard, and this would stick out beyond. And it, it was like an auto leaf spring that was inverted so that it was sideways, and it would scrape the ground and when it came to a grape plant or tree it would spring back and it had a wheel on the end so it wouldn't uh, damage the tree. So I, I worked with that for quite a while and I was able for $500 to figure out a way to keep the weeds out. Of it. And it's still used today. Three times, <laughs> three times a year they go through. Uh, three times a year. It's as fast as the hydraulic units so it's but it's a little bit difficult because it's mounted on the three-point. You have to look back and you have to drive forward and look back at the same time. He um, came home for me and, uh, one day and he says, well, Jimmy wants me to do this biodynamic farming. And I says, well, what is that? And he says, well, it's some kind of hocus pocus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, stirring it's up or, the or, Organic plus hocus pocus, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I've, I've become uh, 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 almost a believer. Yeah, tell them how you've... Uh, My experiences uh, have, have, have uh, uh, been brought to the forefront. And uh, so things like uh, we were walking through the vineyard one day. Jimmy hired a, a, a fellow, a Frenchman, uh, who was a biodynamic expert. Philippe. Philippe, he would come up and we walk through the vineyard once a, once a month. So we're down in the lower part of the vineyard walking through and he turns to me and he says, uh, have you ever uh, tested your tendrils? And I thought, well, no, I've, where do you get your tendrils tested? He said, no, 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 test it. And <laughs> with the French accent, see. And one of the guys behind me think, says, I, th I think he means tasted your tendrils. And the tendrils, you know, the little curly things that latch on the wire. Um, <laughs> he, uh, I said, oh, tasted? No, I've never tasted the tendrils. Well, here. So he grabbed some off the vine, you know, and I tasted them, and boy, they were, they were uh, tart, uh, clean. Uh, refreshing. Uh, I, I was, I was astounded. Just I'd never done that, <laughs> and you ought to try it sometime. Just, <laughs> just to try it out, see what they taste like. But I said, well, that's good. You know, I, I, I could even put that on my salad. 
And he says, I said, well, but I got nothing to compare it to. You know, what was it like before I started biodynamics? Ah! So he runs down to the next vineyard down across the road, which is not biodynamic, gets some tendrils, brings them back up, and we taste those. And it was night and day. What did the non Earthy, musty, uh, not fresh, uh, just not good at all. On the deer? And, and then, of course, when we planted the vineyard, we didn't put deer fence up. And uh, we didn't have much of a problem with deer. And all through the, you know, 30 years, no deer problem. No fence. And uh, then when we started biodynamics, within a few years, the deer were in the vineyard eating the grapes, eating the vines. Because they tasted better. Yeah. They're still com they still have to uh, protect this vineyard. Uh, Brooks has it now. Um, they still have to protect it from the deer because they come and want to eat. So we have the, put the deer we alarms. A, yeah, we have an audio broadcast the sound of a distressed deer. People used to use That's guns, um, four-wheelers with flags. I would go come here when he was at deer. work. Not, no, that for was birds. for birds, yeah. yeah. That was another thing was the birds. And so we put the bird alarms up too. And uh, keeping all those critters off the vineyard there for a while we had a farmer up here who just loved to pop the birds um, you know you have to get a permit but so a lot of the fir trees around here have flat tops but <laughs> they've all come back <laughs> but now we just use the alarms and they work Excellent. well I think that concludes our first portion